they were going to make a scratch game that lets you kind of think about how photons and light and filters work um, and how that relates to creating images of astronomical uh, observations that are made with telescopes. And so for the game, it, here you switch through and the filter, as you click on the button, allows certain kinds of light, certain photons to come through. And those images, or those uh, photons will allow you to build this image of a cat. You can see you start out with a completely transparent cat. And then slowly as you gather photons through the game, uh, the cat gets more and more filled in. And so your image is sort of built up as you're collecting these different types of light. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, stay tuned and I will walk you through how to make this game. Before we get into coding, let's talk a little bit about color and light and what that has to do with space and with NASA's missions. So I want you to think back and remember the first times that you talked about color. Um, think about those conversations. And my guess is some of you probably remember learning about the primary colors in, in kindergarten or in preschool, right? Red, yellow, and blue. Well, it turns out that those are one system of primary color, but they're not the most useful system of primary color. If you've ever looked at a printer or had to replace the toner or ink, most printers run on the three colors, the three primary colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. If you look at a red that's been printed by a printer and you can still see the dots of color in there, it's a mixture of yellow and magenta. And the same with dark blue, it's a mixture of cyan and magenta. Um, I, f I think the reason we teach kids blue, red, and yellow in, in primary school is because those are a lot easier words to manage for a four or five-year-old than cyan and magenta. Um, but that is one, uh, one way of looking at colors. This is what's called a subtractive system, and it's used with pigments and dyes. And a subtractive system in this case means that cyan is absorbing all of the light except for that color of blue that we see and it's reflecting that back out. So when you mix paints together um, and you mix the red and the yellow paint to get orange, that orange paint is absorbing wavelengths of light that are not orange and then reflecting the orange light back out. In contrast, um, colors are an additive system and the three primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. If you've really ever gotten up really close to an old TV, you can see that the pixels are made up of little spots of red, green, and blue light. And all of the images that we see are made up of different combinations and strengths of those different colors of light. Um, you'll notice that these are kind of inverted. When you mix, excuse me, red and green light, you get yellow. Um, just like you mix yellow and magenta paint to get red. So those are the primary color systems and the system of light is known as an additive system because as you combine different types of light, different colors of light, they change. So let's talk a little bit about the human eye. Um, the pupil in the center of our eye, you might know is not black because it's like a black thing. It's black because it's a gap. It is a hole into our eye that light goes into but does not come back out of. And since the back of our eye, the retina, absorbs most of that light, that's why our pupil appears black. It's what allows us to see. Uh, when it gets dark and your pupils get larger, it's because our, our eyes are trying to get more light inside of them so they can see better. Um, when you then turn on the lights in a dark room, your pupils get small and contract to limit the amount of light that's coming in. And so as it comes, as the light does come in your eye, the retina on the back is made up of two different types of cells. Um, there are rod cells, which are really good at um, assessing how much light is being received. The rod cells are what tell you if something is darker or brighter. And then the cone cells are um, what allow you to see in color. They are each attuned to a particular wavelength of light. And so they will activate when you are um, seeing something that's in that particular color. And perhaps unsurprisingly, those cone cells 
come in three different types in most people. They come in red, blue, and green, just like on the last slide where we saw those colors of light, red, blue, and green. Um, using these little, uh, little party emojis instead of cones, most mammals have two sets. And that's why if you've ever heard that dogs are colorblind, um, they have two different types of cone cells. Humans and a lot of marsupials have three for red, blue, and green. People who are colorblind are typically lacking one type of those. Um, and red-green color blindness is the most common, so they're, they're lacking that cone. Um, but there are other animals that can see in more, um, in more wavelengths than we can. There's a lot of insects that have a fourth set of cones that are tuned to UV light. And so those cells in their eyes um, allow them to see flowers in ways that we can't. Lots of flowers have areas that absorb or reflect ultraviolet light that give them brilliant patterns that we can't see, but that allow bees and other insects to know where to go to get the pollen and to know how they work. Uh, the mantis shrimp is really an outlier and has between 12 and 16 different types of, um, of cone type cells that allow them to see many different colors. And if you've never seen a mantis shrimp, I highly suggest you pause and Google one. They are a phenomenal looking creature. So talking about color blindness, I don't know about you, but I've got several people in my family who are um, color blind. And one of the common tests for color blindness are what are called these Ishihara diagrams. And I can read two numbers in the center of these. I have to admit, it's easier to read the 12 for me than it is to read the 74. But to someone who is colorblind or partially colorblind, it would be difficult to discern that there was any difference here. Those colors of dots would look very similar to them. Um, and colorblindness is a trait that is carried on the sex chromosomes, the X and Y chromosomes, which means that it is much more common in men than in women. So in this first scenario here, if you have a father who is not colorblind, who has fine color vision, and a mother who has fine color vision, but carries one copy of the, the gene that limits the types of um, cone cells that can be produced, she will still have normal vision um, and able to, her body will have the different, three different types of cones in them because she has one copy of those genes that is not um, affected. But that means she has a 50-50 chance of passing the gene that will cause colorblindness onto her sons. Um, and a 50-50 chance of passing that gene onto her daughter who would then also be a carrier. If a father's colorblind, he will not have any colorblind sons unless his wife is either colorblind or a, um, or a carrier for them. Um, because the man gives a Y chromosome to the sons in his family. And since Y chromosomes don't contain a whole lot of genes, um, that they don't have any genes for the cells in your eyes. Um, however, it does mean that all of his daughters will be carriers because um, all of them will get an X chromosome from him. Okay, so that's why it is more likely for boys to have um, color blindness than girls because it's an X-linked chromosome. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with space? Let's uh, walk it back and start talking about telescopes a little bit. So that first telescope you see pictured there, maybe you've used one on a dark, clear night. Um, you put your eye up to the eyepiece and you point it at the moon or at a planet and you can see that planet. The light uh, enters the telescope, it bounces off of some mirrors that are in there and goes directly into your eye. Your eye with its cones at the back of it processes it for color, the rods process the light and you can see the enhanced image through the telescope. The next, uh, the next picture that you see there is of the Hubble Space Telescope and there's no one in space who is putting their eye up to the Hubble Space Telescope to see what it is seeing. That, that picture there doesn't have any scale, but the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of a bus. So there's not going to be anyone out there who's looking through it. We're not going to send an astronaut out on the spacewalk to just sort of maneuver around it and try to get an image from it. It sends its information back to Earth in the form of radio waves. And the way that 
that means that any information that it has, any, any image data that it's generating, the pictures that it's making, have to be able to be encoded in um, binary code or some kind of equivalent. It has to be sent in a message the same way that we send any information over radio waves or over, um, you know, through the internet or things like that. So what happens is the Hubble uses filters. And just like there are some cells in your eyes that are good at looking at green light, some that are good at looking at red, and some that are good at looking at blue light, and they're designed for that, the Hubble uses filters. And so when it puts its red filter on, it takes what is a black and white image where the only light that's coming through is red light. And then it'll switch to a different filter and take a picture where it's only getting information on green light, but that picture would still look black and white to us. And then a third filter in blue or whatever other filters it has on there, it has many. It takes that picture, it uses digital photography. So it's essentially a series of ones and zeros, ons and off. It looks at every pixel that it can see uh, of, of the night sky and it says, okay, I get light, I don't get light. I get light, I don't get light. And then it sends that message back to earth via those radio waves where there is a computer that can process it and reconstitute it into an image. That same on, off, on, off, on, off. Um, astronomers can then say, okay, because this was taken with the red filter, we know that this is tinted, that if we tint this red, that'll be what the Hubble Space Telescope saw. And if we can combine it with what it saw in green and in blue, then we can get an image, just like when your printer puts on those dots of magenta, cyan, and yellow ink onto the paper, it will give us a color image by using those different filtered ones. That third telescope there is uh, one that we have here in West Virginia. It is the Green Bank Telescope. And it may not look like a telescope to you. It certainly doesn't look like the other two that are pictured here. It looks like a big satellite dish. And that's what it is. It's a radio telescope. It's designed not to look at the visible part of the light spectrum, but to look at the part of the spectrum that's in radio waves. Okay, and these radio waves come to us not just from radio stations here on Earth, but from objects way out in space that emit these kind of radio waves and that they can travel to us. And that's a whole other story I would love to get into sometime. But even the, even the Green Bank Telescope that's taking pictures of part of the spectrum that we don't see, we can color code those images to have them to make them easier to read and to help us visualize what it is that the, what information it is that the Green Bank Telescope is gathering about the radio spectrum. And so you may have, uh, if you've ever seen an infrared camera, you'll see something like this. Infrared is part of the spectrum um, that is, is heat, right? And so an infrared camera will take a temperature reading of its surroundings and it will assign a false color image to them. So the darker areas in this picture are purple, the lighter areas are brighter, whiter. Um, and so you can see the people's faces in this picture are a yellowish color because human beings are hot compared to their environment most of the time. And so we radiate heat as opposed to these uh, cooler areas in the room. So um, these are the the kind of false color images that are kind of similar to what we do with space as well. We'll take pictures in the infrared spectrum and then scientists will assign them color values to make it easier for us to understand and make it easier for us to read. Okay, and I've just got two sites on here that I think are really cool. So just before we get to coding, I'm gonna show those to you really quick. The first one is Adobe Color. And if you're interested in any kind of digital art, this is a great one. You can choose a particular um, color and it will give you um, a color palette based on that color. And you can choose a bunch of different ones from here. You can adjust them. And something that they've just added recently are these accessibility tools that um, let you know if two colors you've chosen will look similar to someone who is colorblind so that you can avoid having um, like it says A and C are in conflict so these are really close together. I would agree with that and then you can adjust it so that they're not too close together and those lines would indicate that they're overlapping and would be very similar and hard to tell the difference between 
for someone who's colorblind. Another one that I just found out about Kruwers, um allows you to make palettes or explore palettes people have made. So if you click generate, anytime you hit space, it will come up with five new colors that you can look at. Oof. And it will allow you to play around with it. So you can lock them. Like if I particularly like this color, now I can keep it and look for other ones. And then this uh, glasses icon up here will show you what um, your color palette that you've chosen looks like for people with these different types of color blindness. And so you can get an idea of what they would see when they're looking at the colors you've chosen. So if you're designing a website or something and you want to make sure that your text is really visible against your background, this is something that can help you with that. So this link is down below, but if for some reason you can't follow the link there, to get to the program, you're going to want to go to scratch.mit.edu slash projects slash 54306737 I'll see you in a minute to get started coding. All right, so now that you've had a little bit of the science, now you've seen how the game that we're going to make is work, you've made a copy of it yourself, let's get down to actually doing some coding. So down here in our sprites menu, we've got these, um, I don't know, what is that? Nine different sprites. We're going to start out on the one that is the cat that has color, right? We've got this one cat that's just an outline. We're going to start on the one that is colored in right now. And I always um, will accidentally move something around and then not be happy with where it is. So I typically start by going down to the events menu, and that's where all my hat blocks live. These are the things that tell the program, okay, if this happens, then run my program. Uh, and I pull in when the green flag is clicked. Let me make that a little bigger, easier to see. That just means when the program starts. So anything I attach under this hat block will um, run every time the program starts. And what I want to have happen is for it to go back to the position that it's in now. So I'm gonna go up to motion and this fifth block down says go to x y it's okay if your numbers are different than mine uh, but they'll match exactly where the cat is on the screen so if you want the cat someplace else the best thing to do is to just drag your cat around to where you want it and then pull this thing in and again i just put that in there in case i have my sprite move during the game or in case i accidentally move it and i'm not happy with where it ended up uh, I want to make sure that this cat has the colored costume because I copied the um, same cat here. I could delete this other costume if I wanted to, um, but just in case I'm going to leave it in there. So I'm going to switch costume to color instead of outline. And if you copied mine, it should have the same stuff in there. Um, if not, and you're making your own, I am confident that you can figure out what to do with that there. And I want it to start out with the cat being empty, with it looking blank. And so I'm going to go down this looks menu, which is the purple one, to change color effect by 25. I don't want to change the color effect though, so I'm going to click on this menu where it says color, and I'm going to change it to ghost. And I'm going to, oh, and it says change, and that's not the one I want. I make this mistake all the time, so I'm glad that it happened and I can tell you about it. 50% of the time if something has gone wrong, it's because instead of grabbing a, ch a set block, which is the one that I want, I grabbed a change block. They look very similar, but they do very different things. I don't want to change the ghost effect. I want to set the ghost effect. And I want to set it to 100, as in 100%, so all the way. So now I can just take this code I don't need and drop it over here and it goes away. Now when I click the green flag, what should happen is the cat should go to this position. It should look like it's in color, but then immediately after that, it's going to disappear, right? Because if it's 100% ghosted, that means it's 100% not visible. So let's see if that happens. Hey, all right. My cat is transparent. That's exactly what I want. So let's go over from the cat that's in color to the black and white outline cat. And what I want it to do is I'm going to do the same kind of thing. I'm going to go to events, pull in when the green flag is clicked. Why is this not big? I guess I thought I only wanted the other cat to be big. So when the green flag is clicked, 
going to go up to motion, pull in the go to X, Y, and then um, just in case I'm going to put a show block in here. It really doesn't need to be there. I guess I'll leave it out. And I want to make sure that the costume is the outline costume. So I'll put that one in there as well. So now on my transparent cat, it's got the outline costume. It's in that position. That's actually the only code we're going to have in this cat. Um, the only other piece that I might want to have in here is go to layer because I want this cat to be at the back. Okay. I want my uh, cat that becomes more and more visible, less and less transparent as the game goes on to be in front because there's like some weird overlapping arm things here that I never took care of um, in the, in the costume editor. I could go in and erase those if I really wanted to, but I don't. Um, and so I want that behind where the cat is becoming less and less transparent. Okay, so this cat is done. Let's go back to our, our colorful cat. And we need to tell it uh, what's going to happen when, uh, how, to, how to become less transparent as the game goes on. So I'm going to go down to events and I'm going to need to pull in this when I receive message block. And I'm going to say new message. And I'm going to call this color... Uh, underscore up. I like using underscores because a lot of times in text-based programming languages you can't use spaces because it'll mess up your code. You have to use underscores if you want to separate uh, terms like that. So just to get in the habit of it I like using it in Scratch as well. So I'm gonna call it color up and what's gonna happen is when my little uh, photon lightning bolts reach a certain place it's gonna send the message color up. And then that will um, that will tell the little little guy to get more colorful. If I program it that way, I haven't programmed it that way yet. So I'm going to go up to looks, and this time I do want change color effect, not set color effect. So up here it's set because I want it to start out at a hundred. Down here I want it to be change, and instead of color I want it to be ghost. So those two should be the same. Uh, I did the math, and here I start out with 7, 5, and 1. 90% sure that's true. I'm going to set that here in just a sec. It's not that. It's 10, 7, and 1. I see in my notes. So 10, 7, and 1 add up to 18. 100 divided by 18 is, is 5 with uh, 5 repeating, 5.5 repeating. So because I'm changing it from 100 to less, I wanted to go down to 0 eventually. I'm going to do negative 5.5 and I really should round it to 5.6. I'm not sure how uh, granular it gets in Scratch, but we'll, we'll do that. Um, I don't think I can put in the fraction 5 and 5 ninths, but I would if I could. Okay, so that reminds me that I also need to set these variables. I'm having these variables get set, and this will be the number of red photons that are needed, the number of green photons that are needed, and the number of blue photons that are needed on the cat, just in case I want to add other levels later. Like maybe I want different sprites in there that change different colors. So I'm going to put the code for what the photon like requirements are on this sprite itself. So let's go down to variables. And if you copied the program uh, that is linked in the description below, you should have all these variables already. If not, you can add them in. Um, shouldn't be a big deal, but here we go. We're going to pull in set. And again, make sure you're grabbing set and not change. And we need three of them because we're setting red, green, and blue. So I'm just going to go in here and change these. If you click on these squares, you can see that. And the way I calculated it was red is 10, green is 7, and blue is 1. What I did to calculate it was I looked up on the internet what the hex value of the orange in the cat is. If you haven't used hexadecimal, it's a very common format of how colors are expressed on the internet. So any web page you visit, um, any, any app you're in, uses hexadecimal color. And there's two values that represent how much red, two values that represent how much green, two values that represent how much blue. So when I looked at the um, hex values of the scratch cat, these are the proportions. I divided it. They're out of 255, and that seemed like too long to play the game. Um, but <laughs> this is a more manageable number. Okay, hopefully you're with me. 
We are going to come back to this cat one more time, but let's go ahead and move on to the lightning bolts. All right, we've programmed our cat. Time to move on to the lightning bolts. We're going to start with red. And what we do for red, we're going to mostly copy over with some changes to green and blue. When I was programming this the first time, I was really disappointed that I couldn't figure out a way to just use uh, clones of a single lightning bolt and change the color of the clones. If you can figure out a way to do this program with fewer sprites, I really want to hear about it because I, I'm not at the point yet where I could figure that one out and it was a little bit frustrating to me. So um, I have in here two different costumes for each of the um, red and green things and the filter. And we're gonna use the um, colorblind friendly ones for this initial tutorial. I'll make another video about how you can make a colorblind safe mode that you switch on and off. So I'm going to go through and switch it from lightning red to lightning red CD. You see I've drawn um, lines through it. And then I'm going to do the same thing for the others now while I'm thinking about it. The red one has the matching stripes in it, the red filter, right? So that those get matched up. Um, the green has spots on it. So I'm going to change the filter button to have those spots as well. Uh, and then blue, I left the same. So I figured having stripes having spots and having solids would be the easiest way to differentiate between the three little lightning bolts. And then that way, if someone has a hard time telling the difference between the red and the green, they can look for the spots versus the stripes. This helps people who are colorblind, but it also just helps everyone. It's nice to have multiple cues that tell you what the differences are. And so that's how we're gonna do it from the baseline. And we'll have an additional one um, that I'll show you how to, if you wanna make it so that they're all solid. Um, and have that colorblind mode that you can switch on and off. Okay, let's go back to the lightning bolt. Let's go back to the code panel from the costumes and get started. So we're going to start with when the green flag is clicked again. It's really bugging me. I have to make this big every time, but I can handle that. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be making clones of this lightning bolt. And so what's gonna happen is uh, we're gonna want the original to be hidden. So I'm gonna go up to looks, I'm gonna scroll down to where these two short ones are and I'm gonna put in hide. I'm gonna give the codes a behavior, but I'm not gonna give the original a behavior. So if I left it visible, it would just be sitting there just looking kind of weird like a little photon that's not doing anything. So I'm gonna have it hidden, but I'm gonna pull in the show block while I'm here because it's gonna be important for me to tell it when you, I start as a clone, don't stay hidden, show yourself so that we can see the clones when they show up. Okay, and then costume is the other thing I wanna put on here. And instead of switch costume to lightning red, I'm gonna have it be lightning red CD because we want those, uh, those stripes on it so that it, that's what it looks like. So in the variables, I over-engineered it. I put in way more variables than you actually probably need because I wanted to give you that flexibility in case you wanted to change how fast things spawn, um, how fast they move. If you wanna change those, that's easier to do with a variable than it is with going back through your code and trying to find all the places where you put in that number. And so um, you can even include uh, some of those variables being visible as sliders and letting your players determine how fast they want things to happen. So you'll notice there's a lot of variables in here and we need to define those variables. So we're gonna do that on this um, red lightning bolt. Okay, so pull in set and we're gonna be using set again, not change. So make sure that says set. And the first one we're going to set is frequency. And the frequency is going to be how often um, these things happen. And I played around with an I like 0.25. The next one we're going to set is speed. And I'm going to start out with my speed. Nope, not reps. Being one. And then I'm going to set reps is my next one. And I'm going to use a little bit of math. 
It was an engine outside that was pretty loud, so hope you didn't hear it. So we're going to set reps yet next, and we're going to use a little math for that. And to get to math, we're going to go to operators. And I want the division symbol. I'm going to leave it down here for now, but eventually I will pop it in here. And the reason I'm going to do this down here is because I'm going to put a variable in here. And um, it's easier to do that outside because sometimes in here it'll like pop things out if you do it that way. Up to you though. And 420 is the sort of width of the field. It goes from X is 210 to X, sorry, negative 210 to positive 210. So the number of times that you're gonna repeat something is the distance divided by the speed. I'll, I'm doing a little hand waving here, but I hope you'll bear with me. Okay, now we're gonna go down to control and I'm gonna pull in a repeat until block. I don't wanna tell it exactly um, how many times I want it to do this. I think I could use a forever block instead, but I'm just gonna leave a repeat until and leave the condition, which is the hexagonal sort of gap here, blank. And then I'm gonna pull in a wait block. And then I'm gonna go down here to where the clones are and say create clone of myself. I don't want this to be one second though. I'm going to want it to be math. And so I'm gonna have it be one over the frequency. And I'm gonna go back to variables and pull in frequency. And then I pop that in there. Okay, so what this is saying is, okay, my original red photon, hide it, make sure it's got the colorblind safe uh, costume on, set these variables, and then you're going to every one divided by frequency seconds. And so if this is one divided by 0.25 right now, uh, one over one fourth would be four seconds. So every four seconds, create a clone of myself, okay? The nice thing about this is that if later in the game, like if you wanna add in a mechanic where it speeds up as it goes along, um, you can change that using code in the game. So that's why we're using these variables here so that this can change more easily without having to put in copies of blocks of code. All right. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna copy this code over to the, light, the, to the green photon and to the blue photon, but we're gonna change it a little bit. So to copy it over to a different piece of code, you have to grab it from the top block. If you grab it from one of the other blocks, it'll separate. And so I'm gonna grab it from here. And then if you'll notice when I bring it near the other sprites, they sort of wiggle a little bit. You want it to wiggle over the green one and then you drop it in. The, it snaps back to being in red, so I'm not getting rid of it on the red photon. But now if I go over to green, it is in here as well. I absolutely don't want to set this multiple times. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this repeat until, set it to the side, and then I'm gonna grab these three that are set and put them over here uh, to get rid of them, then click this back into place. The other thing I need to change is this costume. There's no lightning red CD um, in the green one. There's a lightning green CD, so I wanna make it that one. And then I'm gonna take this shortened block because that's really all I want. Oops. And I'm gonna put it in the blue photon as well. Okay. And so the only thing I need to change now is instead of lightning green, I just want it to be lightning. For the blue, I didn't name it and I probably should have, but we're gonna leave it alone. So for the um, blue, because it's solid, it only has one costume, so it'll look the same in both the colorblind safe and regular, well, not regular, but not colorblind safe versions. Okay, so this was like my setup, and this is telling me how fast that clones happen, but now I need to tell the clones that have been created what to do, and that's gonna be my next bit of code. All right, so I'm gonna give myself some space over here. And the block that I want is in the control menu towards the bottom, and it's when I start as a clone. So now I'm gonna tell the red photon 
what to do when it starts as a clone. I wanted to start by showing itself and then I want it to kind of line up along this part of the game space, okay? I don't want it to show up randomly anywhere. I want it to show up somewhere on this edge, but I want that edge to be sort of like, I want the X to be the same. I want it to be in the same X position, but I want its Y position to vary. So we're gonna set a variable for that part. So I'm gonna go up to motion and I'm gonna say go to X, Y. I like negative 213. Um, you're welcome to change it, but I just happen to like that spawn position, but I don't like this 40, because if I do this, they'll all spawn in the same place. And I bet if I click the button, that might start happening with the red one. Let's see. It'll take four seconds though, remember. There we go. And now every four seconds, a new one will appear there. And if I wasn't moving them out of the way, they would just look stacked on top of each other. So if I keep waiting, it's gonna look like there's no more that are happening. I want those things to spread out though. So I'm gonna stop. When you stop, all the clones delete themselves. Um, and let's, uh, let's see what happens. Okay, down to operators, which is in green. And I'm gonna pull in this pick random and just drop it into that spot. You see if you hover it over where that Y bubble is, um, It'll just drop into place. And I want it to be anywhere from negative 130 to positive 170. Now when I click this, it should start populating up and down a little bit. Oh, that one's in almost the same place as it was before. That makes me a little nervous. Okay, feeling better. Yeah, they're spreading out. That's good, that's what we want. But now we need them to move. Just sitting here is definitely not good enough and not going to be a very fun game. Uh, certainly not a winnable one. So I'm gonna go down to controls and I'm gonna pull in a repeat. I'm gonna go to variables and pull in reps. So remember how I set reps to uh, whatever 420 is divided by the speed? That is the length of the field that it's traveling down divided by how fast it is going. So that's uh, the reason I'm using a variable there is because it's gonna make it easier to adjust as we go on if we want to. So I'm gonna go to motion and I want change X by. I'm not gonna change the Y value. It's just gonna go in a straight line. And <laughs> you can see this is what happens when change X by 10 is in here. It's gonna shoot over like that. But again, I'm using variables so that these things are changeable. And I'm gonna put in change X by speed. Right now our speed is just one. So they move very leisurely across the screen. Now, the next bit of code is going to check to see what filter is in place because I only want the red ones to get through if the red filter is active. So I'm gonna go down to condition, control because anytime I say if, or I only want it to happen when, I need a conditional statement. So I'm gonna pull in an if then and I'm gonna check to see, and checking to see means going down to this operators menu and pulling in this uh, bubble equals 50. So I'm gonna check to see if, oh, that's not the one I want, my apologies. Let's go back. I want the one that says red is greater than 50. Yeah, that's the one I want, that's the greater than sign. So I'm gonna go to variables, I'm gonna pull in red, Yeah, okay, let me back up. Remember how I said this was checking to see if the filter's red or not? That's not what this code is doing. No, this code is um, going to... Sometimes you can't even read your own notes sometimes, right? Like this is, this is a normal thing to have happen when you are programming, so I'm leaving it in. I'm gonna trust past self that I wasn't messing it up too bad and we're gonna just put in what I have in my notes and figure out what it does later, okay? So then I'm going to change red by negative one and then delete this clone. That doesn't seem right. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna go with it. Better, better deliver past self. Oh, I know why it works. Okay, so 
it's because this happens, this check happens after it's repeated however many times is the variable stored in reps. Okay, so if we start this over again, remember it's not checking the filter right now. So it's gonna go through that blue filter, which is not the behavior that we want in the actual game. But then it's only gonna check to see if red is more than zero once it runs out of its repetitions. If it hits a filter, what we're gonna to try to program it is if it hits this blue filter, it will, um, it will delete itself before it gets to this if command. So that's why we're okay on this. All right, figured it out. Past self did a good job. Let's get this done. Um, I am going to eventually copy this into the green and the blue uh, bolts as well, but let's get these uh, behaviors working a little bit better before we get in there. So I'm just dragging my space down here so I've got some more um, room. I try to keep my code in small chunks that each do one thing uh, because that's just good hygiene. So I'm going to pull in another when I start as a clone block and I'm going to put a forever loop in there. And forever loops are great. There's something where they're always checking. And what I'm going to do first is an if then. And I'm going to go down to the sensing menu, which is like this kind of light blue turquoise kind of thing. And I'm going to pull in a touching color. And what I want is if the red is touching either the blue or the green filter, I'm going to have it delete itself. Whoops. I want to go to control for delete this clone. And uh, so I need to tell this what color I want. If I click on here, I could enter in the values that are the same as this, or I can use this fun little uh, eyedropper technique down here and click. And now when the clones are touching the color, they delete themselves. The thing is though, the way it looks, it almost looks like they're disappearing before they get to the filter. And I want them to disappear a little bit after that. Like I want it to look like they're actually touching the filter and it doesn't really look like they're touching the filter. So I'm gonna pull in a weight block and I'm gonna have it be like uh, 0.3. Let's see what that looks like. That's a little bit better. I think I can live with that. You fine tune it to whatever thing that you want it to be. Okay, so now they're being cleared out by the blue filter, which is exactly the behavior we want. I am going to right click or on a Mac, you hold down, um, oh gosh, now that I said that, you hold down control and then click. Uh, if you're on an iPad, if you just press and hold, this little menu should pop up and you want the one that says duplicate. Again, you have to do this on the top hat block so you get the whole group. And the reason I'm duplicating this is because I want the same thing to happen when it hits the green filter. I could um, switch over to the green filter, but I made sure that the green and the filter button is exactly the same. So I'm just gonna use the same eyedropper trick and make sure I get a good spot of the green um, button and then that'll be the same. Okay, so let's get this in here and copy these over for uh, blue and green. So this one, I'm gonna pop into green and then I'm gonna pop into blue. This one down here, I'm actually gonna pay attention. Um, I don't want the blue photon to get deleted when it hits the blue filter. So I'm not gonna put this on blue. I'm just gonna drop it into green same way I don't want the green to get deleted on green, so I'm just gonna pop it into blue, and then let's go ahead and fix those. So in here, they all pile on top of each other, of course. So let's start by spreading them out, getting them out of each other's way. So over here, let's look at this block that I brought in. Remember, this is the one that says, okay, when you start out, go to a random spot, and you can see I've got them starting to come in now, which is nice. They're Oh, okay, that was weird. They were like always in the same order for a minute. So um, the only thing I want to change on here is this if red change red. Um, this is the green photon. So I want this to be if green change green. So I'm going to go down to variables, pull in green, and then change this to green. And you definitely want those to match and to match the color of the one that you're doing. So, good. Now down here, 
I do want this one to delete because it's the green photon if it touches the blue filter, but I also want it to delete if it touches the red filter. So I'm gonna, it's harder to grab it from the moving photon. So I'm gonna do the easy thing and get it from the filter button. So now uh, the green photon should be filtered out by the red filter, okay? Same thing down here on the blue photon. I'm going to change this from uh, blue or from red to blue and change this from red to blue. Uh, you'll notice that blue, green, and red are checked here. That just means that they're visible variables and I have them uh, changed to large. So let's see if this works. If I uncheck red and check it again, now it'll go in the same spot. Let's do it with reps. So I've got reps up here um, and that value is stored. If I right click on it or again, uh, press and hold on the um, iPad or tablet of any kind, control click if you're on a Mac. If you change it to large reader, that's what I did for these photons to make sure that they are visible. And so they're really functioning as labels um, on these things. It's easier than programming in something that changes the number to just have it be your variable. Okay. Uh, last thing I need to do for the lightning bolt is I'm going to right click on here, say duplicate. And again, I want it to, because we're on blue, delete itself in green filter situations and in red filter situations. Okay, that looks good. So if you've been paying close attention, you'll notice that sometimes the lightning bolts just randomly appear on top of each other and then we'll delete themselves. Uh, after our wait time of 0.3 seconds. That is a bug. That's not something I intended to have happen, but I don't hate it either. Like there, the red one just disappeared. I'm actually a little bit upset that the green one didn't disappear because it should have also disappeared. Um, but sometimes that happens if you change things and don't restart the game, if you don't stop and then click the start flag. So let's see about that. So I don't love it, but I don't hate it enough to try to fix it either. So it's gonna stay in the game for now. You are more than welcome to try to fix that bug so that they don't spawn on top of each other or so that it doesn't filter them out when they spawn on top of each other. And there's a couple different ways you could do that. It looked, oh, again, the blue one didn't. That's bizarre. I'm a little bit worried about that, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna press on. Okay. Back to our red lightning bolt, we've got one more thing to add here, and then it's gonna be the information that tells the currently invisible ghosted cat that it needs to color up, right? That was the message we decided on was color up. So again, I'm gonna give myself some more space in red. I'm gonna to go to control and say when I start as a clone, and then under here, this is where we're gonna put our stuff. I'm gonna pull in another forever loop, so it's always checking. I'm going to say if, then, and there's going to be two conditionals that I check. So I'm going to eventually put another if then inside of this box, just, just to keep that on your radar. The first thing I want to check is the X position of the photon. So where it is horizontally on the game board. So to do that, I'm going to go to my operators and I'm going to pull in an equal sign this time. And I really mean equal sign this time. Then I'm going to go up to motion because motion has an inherent variable that's called X position. And so I can put that in there. And then I want this to check when the X position is 150, which is pretty far over here. Um, the cat is at 193, just for reference. And so 150 is before we get to the cat. So what I'm saying so far is when I start as a clone, always be watching for if your X position happens to equal 150. And actually, now that I'm thinking about this, maybe this isn't the best way to go. Maybe I do want not an equal sign there because the way that I program this, change X by speed, if my speed wasn't one, I might not hit 150 exactly. So to future-proof this for myself, I'm gonna, again, I have lied to you and told you to put in a block that was not the right one. I'm going to say if the X position is greater than 150, because then um, if I happen to skip over it for some reason, it's still going to check. Oh, 
Oh, what a good, I'm writing that one down. We're not, we're not trusting past self on that one. Okay, good catch. So now the next thing I want to do is I want to check to see if the um, variable that's associated with this is already zero. So I'm going to go back to control, pull in an if then, and then I'm going to go down to my operators and I'm not going to lie to you this time. I know I said that last time, but it's true now. <laughs> I want a greater than. So if red, so that's in my variables, if red is greater than zero, then I want to change, not set, change red by negative one. And then I want to go to events and broadcast color up. So what this means is when I start as a clone the whole time, I want you to be checking what your X position is. Once it's more than 150, which is probably somewhere over here, check to see if red is zero or if it's more than zero. And if it is more than zero, then take it down by one because each photon counts as one and then broadcast color up. And now we can't tell if it's working or not yet because this is a blue filter and so all the red photons are clearing out. So I'm just gonna go over to the filter costume and change it by hand. Um, because I want it to be colorblind friendly. Oh, the blue one got through, that's not good. Let's see what the next one does. Yep, I messed up the blue one somehow. I know what to fix next. Oh, why did it go immediately to zero? There are many problems here. Okay, let's figure this out. Uh, the blue one's going to be easier to fix, so let's start over there. I think what probably happened is I didn't pick exactly the right color. So let's try that. It looks like it works. Let's see. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Problem one fixed. Problem two, we're going to start over and see if it happens again. I'm a little concerned. So, filter. I know what's happening. I know why it did that. Okay. So this is why uh, when I had it at equal, it was fine for me. And now that I have it as greater than 150, it's not working. Because now every time any photon is past 150, it goes up. So I think I have to delete the clone. this part do again why why did I not just have that do this why did why don't I just put let's see I'm gonna pull this out of here let's see what happens my apologies as I debug this live okay oh, well that was a bad start the little red photon annihilated itself again twice in a row shouldn't shouldn't happen three times in a row so let's see what I'm hoping to happen is that this uh, 10 will change to nine when this one gets all the way over here. It did, it did. So guess what? I'm gonna just cross this one out in my notes. This was totally useless and buggy chunk of code. So I'm gonna get rid of this and this. My apologies to you if you had those in there, but you know what? A necessary part of coding is fixing things that are wrong. So this is just an authentic experience. And the only thing I need to do is to change this broadcast uh, color up to put that in there. And so hopefully, yeah, I feel like I'm seeing my cat come a little bit clearer into focus bit by bit. You can see it's starting to change to a little more orange of a color. This is good. I think we're good to go. Okay. So I'm gonna take this broadcast and I'm gonna drop it into the green uh, photon or lightning bolt and the blue photon or lightning bolt, just to remind me to put it in there as well. So the green one, whoops, not down here. We want it all the way back up here. So right under where it says green, we're gonna change it to color up to blue, same thing, and then color up. The reason that, um, I'm not differentiating here is just because it's easier. If I wanted a really authentic game, the red would sort of control how much red was in the cat. The green would control how much green and the blue would control how much blue. 
I didn't want to make that level of complexity in here. But if you do, I would love to see your code for it because I think it could be really cool. And I do think there's a way to do it where you could have the cat turn red when there are red photons and then turn more accurately colored as it adds in the green or the blue or vice versa. Okay, one last thing with the, oh no, I think that might be it. I think we fixed it. So now if I change the filter manually, and that'll be the next thing we program, um, the different photons should go through. And I'm just gonna check to make sure that this goes to six. Oh, it did not, that's not good. And this goes to one. It did, oh, it did go to zero. Why didn't the green one work? Let me make sure it wasn't just a fluke. So the blue's working, the red's working. We may have an issue with the green. Let's see. Six. Okay. I don't know what it was with that first green one. So far, it seems like it's working. Okay. The next chunk that we're going to work on um, is the filter itself. And then we'll do the buttons. And then we are just about done. So I would say more than halfway. And we have a really good start to our game right now. All right, we have been coding for a long time now, and I will be honest, in between uh, when you just saw me and now, I stood up and walked around for a little bit. I highly recommend that you do the same and take a little bit of a stretch break before we get started again. Okay, I hope you've stretched and maybe gotten a drink and, and taken care of yourself. So we're gonna select the filter now, and the fil filter uh, image is really just a horizontal line uh, for red, you can see that I've got the colorblind safe version that has the same sort of stripes out of it. The green color safe version has little dots running through it and the blue, there's only one costume because the blue are solid. So that makes our uh, third thing that has the correct color coding. And all we're gonna do for the, um, for the filter is to give it a start position, just in case I accidentally move it around as I often do. So it goes back to the same place on the screen. The place on the screen matters because we told, no, the place on the screen doesn't matter. I take it back. You can put it wherever you want it. Just kidding. So uh, we'll have where it starts to idiot proof it for me. And then we'll have how to change its costume. Okay. And the way it'll change the costume is if the player clicks on one of these filter buttons over here, it'll change the costume. Okay. So let's get started. Pull in that hat block when the green flag is clicked and then go up to motion and I'm going to say go to XY. I personally want my filter to always start out on red. I think it's a more player friendly version since our uh, little cat is starting out at red. So I'm going to go to um, switch costume two and change it to red CB, which is the colorblind one. So now when I click the green start flag, that's what it starts as. Okay, now uh, I'm gonna go down here to messages, which are in the events menu. When I receive, and I'm gonna say new message, my messages are gonna be really simple. One's gonna be called red. Uh, one is going to be called blue. Oh, I'll do green first, because that's RGB. That's the order that they go in in the electromagnetic spectrum. So I will keep that consistent, just red, green, and blue. And now all I need to do is put the costume block in there that says which thing sh it should change to when it gets the red message. The next step we're gonna do is we're gonna program those buttons to send those messages. So switch costume to red CB when I receive red. For green, we're gonna say switch costume to green CB and for blue, we're gonna say switch costume to blue. And remember there's only one costume for blue because the blue is solid and that's the, that's the cue that we have for that one that's not dependent on perceiving the color. That's it for the filter, it is that simple, okay? So if you wanna see them like that, I have them laid out next to each other. You absolutely don't have to. If you've got a better organizational strategy, go with that for you. Okay, 
So filter red is where I'm going to start. Um, and its code is also very simple. Going to go to events, say when the green flag is clicked. Going to make it big. <laughs> and then go up to motion. I'm going to pull in my XY. You literally do not need this block. It is just in case you are uh, happen to move things around and want them to go back to where they were. We're going to go to events and we're going to say, oops, not that one. We want when this sprite is clicked because that's how our players are going to interact with the game. They'll click the red, the green, or the blue filter buttons, and that'll change the filter and it'll allow different photons through. When this sprite is clicked, all we're gonna have it do is we're gonna have it broadcast red. Okay, that's it. That's it for that code. Um, I could copy and paste this into all of the other ones just by dragging and dropping it like I had before, but honestly, these codes are pretty easy to do, so I'm just gonna replicate it really fast. Uh, have the green filter go to the um, the spot that it currently occupies on the screen. When it is clicked, have it broadcast green. Okay, and then blue. I really should be testing this before I do it for all of them, just in case there's a mistake. I'm confident in myself right now, and maybe that's going to end up being a mistake. Um, but I think it's going to work. And if not, I'm confident I can fix it. So red is already selected. I'm going to click on green, changes to green. I'll let that one through. Okay, blue changes to blue and red changes it back to red. So our filter buttons are successfully working and that's really exciting. Okay, um, now... There is one more thing I want to do with our cat, which I think I said way back when we started. So let's go ahead and go back to the orange cat. And I'm going to go back to where my notes are for that. So games are more fun when you can win. And so let's program in some win conditions. When the green flag is clicked, we're going to forever check to see if we've won. So I'm going to go down to control, pull in a forever block, and then there's gonna be a conditional statement in there, right? I'm checking to see if I've won. And the way I'm gonna know whether I've won or not is if I add up these variables, which are red, green, and blue, and if they equal zero, if I've collected all the photons that are necessary. I like having this be the check for if we're winning because it doesn't matter where we started at, as long as they end up at zero, they're good. And like I was saying before, if you wanted to make more levels in this game where you had other images that got filled in, um, you could then have that be your, your way of doing it. So uh, we've got these three here. We're going to go to uh, operators. And I actually promise this time you do want the equals one. I'm, I'm not, I'm very confident that I did not mess this one up. We're also going to pull in two of the plus signs, and I'm gonna make this really big so that you can really see. The operators on here go plus, minus, multiply, and divide, and they look really small, and it's easy to mess it up. So you want the first one, and you wanna make sure it has a plus on it. We're going to put this one inside that one, okay? So you can nest these. Um, I believe they function like parentheses, uh, but it shouldn't matter because addition is commutative. It's been a little while since I've actually had to name that property of addition, but it doesn't matter what order you add things up in, they should end up in the same with the same total. Okay, so then we're going to put in our variables. Blue, which is currently zero, and we can see that because we have that variable displayed there. Green, which is currently seven because we have that variable displayed over here and red, which is zero. Okay. We're then going to take this whole thing and I'm not going to grab the green and blue part because remember that's nested inside. I'm going to grab the outer one, which is the one that's, uh, that's got just red and then the other part in it. And I'm going to drop it into one side on here. It doesn't matter which side you drop it into. And then winning is going to be when they're all down to zero. So I'm going to put zero in there and then I'm going to grab it just under the equal sign. So I have the whole thing and pop it into the if then statement. Let's make it a little smaller so it's easier to see there. Okay. 
I know that was a little bit fiddly. This is one of the places where it's getting complicated enough within Scratch. It would be actually easier with a text-based code editor, but that's a story for another day. So now I wanna broadcast the message win. So broadcast new message win. Well, it would help if I typed it. Okay. So now this means that when the sum of the red, green, and blue variables is zero, it will broadcast win. And we need something to happen when it's broadcast win. I'm gonna choose a sprite to tell me that I've won the game. And I like choosing a surprise sprite, a random sprite. We'll see if I like who we get to be my announcer of victory. It's a glass of water, a little disappointing. I'm gonna draw a face on it to feel a little bit better. Uh, it might not actually make me feel better because like drawing with the mouse is always kind of a dodgy aspect, but we'll see. Gave it a little eyes. Oh, they're not really even. Gave it a big happy mouth. All right, we've got an anthropomorphic glass of water. I'm a little bit happier. I kind of want to draw hair on it, but I'm not going to push it. So with our anthropomorphic glass of water, we need it to do something when it receives the win message. So when I receive win, uh, I don't want to see this glass until I've won the game. So I'm going to go up to uh, here in looks menu. I'm going to pull in a show and a hide. I always pull those in in pairs. So when I receive win is when it will be shown. I'm going to pull in this event when the green flag is clicked. So when the game starts, it's going to be hidden. Uh, and just because I read right to left, I'm going to swap these around. There's no functional difference. It's just something that helps me as the human programmer. Okay. When the green flag is clicked, the glass is hidden. When I receive win, the glass will be shown. Uh, and I want it to tell me good job. So I'm going to have it say good job for two seconds. And then I'm going to have it say, you won. And the difference between say for two seconds and say is just that this will, and actually I can test it if I switch to green and start letting some greens through. Um, the difference here is that this will only stay there for two seconds and then move on to the next command. If it says say, it'll keep moving through commands. It'll just have that little thing up there. And I think it stays up indefinitely until you have it say something else. Oh, why is the green not going down? That's kind of a bummer. Wasn't that happening before? And now that I noticed it, it is? Am I misremembering what we set green to? What is happening here? Did I really, was I just that impatient and I didn't let enough through? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> once these go down, um, it should be good and we should be fine. I think that is the last little bit of code that I want. There might be one other thing I wanted to do, but that should be it. So let's see if the little cup says the thing when we get there. We've got just a few more seconds to wait before this all totals zero. Um, and here's our program. There are many ways that you could change or improve this. Oh, uh, it didn't run. Well, I bet it will next time. I bet this wasn't active. Oh yeah, there we go. So if you don't start the game, uh, the new blocks, the new code that you put in sometimes won't run. So now that this is around it, it says uh, when the green flag is clicked forever. Check that and then broadcast win. And then you'll notice this glass is still saying good job. It hasn't moved on to U1. Any ideas why that might be? It's because I'm checking this forever. It keeps broadcasting win because this condition is still true. These will always, um, these will always happen. So what I'm going to do after that to fix this is see this little stop block at the last part of the control menu before you start getting into clones. I'm going to say stop this script after I broadcast win. 
It's a broadcast win. It tells me, good job, you won. And then it's just going to keep saying that. Whew. Um, so, like I was saying, there are many ways you can improve this. One thing I particularly don't like is that the three of them show up at exactly the same time. It would be easy to stagger that because you could just put an extra weight block in here or you could put a weight block in the first time um, to just get them offset from each other in the little photon controls. Uh, but that is the idea of the game. That is the basics there. And now it is yours to work on and improve as you see fit. Um, thank you for going on this journey with me. Let me know if there's something in particular you would like to see done. Uh, and I really hope you enjoy this as much as I have.